How much are you aware of situations whereby the, the, the tenant does not get uh, the uh, deposit refunded and uh, the only way that tenant has of getting back the deposit is to stay illegally in the property for an extra month in order to work out or work off uh, the value of the rent? Thank you, Deputy, um, Deputy Coppinger. <coughs> um, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you um, about the standards in accommodation, firstly, and the second area is the populist left-wing agendas that you've highlighted. Um, the third one is about the number of landlords, and then the fourth one relates to taxes and profits. So I'll just start with the great uh, standards that you feel your members are uh, carrying on in the private rented sector because Threshold last year had 1,836 queries relating to substandard accommodation and they also worryingly raised about even lack of adherence to fire safety. Would these be your members or have you proof that they're not your members? Because you're, you're telling us that your members join up to become familiar with all the regulations. Um, just about populist left-wing agendas on page three, um, you, you want the government to ignore populist left-wing agendas. Does that mean you follow an elitist right-wing agenda then? Because, uh, you know, the two would contrast with each other. Uh, and obviously you, you, you're being very political uh, there. But just on the, the number of landlords in Ireland who you believe are a vital part of the solution to the housing crisis. Um, to me, there's an outsized number of landlords in Ireland, based on all the um, facts. And it's actually increasing, not exiting or decreasing, which we constantly hear from you every day on the radio. Um, in the RTB figures, and they were in here a few days ago, in the quarter one 2015 to quarter one 2016, there was an increase by 15,904 landlords registering properties with them. Okay, so there's only two things that could be going on there. How do you explain that discrepancy between the exiting landlord who can't make a living in the private rented sector that you're telling us about and then those figures because either your members weren't bothering registering with the RTB before and they've suddenly registered or else there is actually an increase in landlords and I believe we'd have to say it's the latter. Um, the just on the, the numbers of landlords in Ireland, the, the numbers of landlords in Ireland, uh, according to the PRTB or the RTB, is between 180 to 190,000. That is 4% of the total population, 5% of the total adult population. Um, in the Dáil, it would seem it's much higher. We have 20 to 25 per cent of TDs landlords. So you can see how actually you're quite well represented in the Dáil, going on the figures. The most recent figures, I think, were about 20 per cent. It's probably even members here. I don't know who are landlords, but my point is, my point is that you're very well represented in the Dáil, right? But you're five times more than the actual population are landlords, you know, in the Dáil. Now, in the UK. About half of that figure is landlords, 2% of the population. So we're expected to believe that it's absolutely dreadful if private landlords aren't increased in Ireland. But I, I actually think it's the opposite. We've too many private landlords, and I'll tell you how most of them got sucked in. It was during the boom when they were told your only way to make money is to get into investing in property. And lots of people, and we know that now, uh, went and they bought an apartment or whatever, or two, or a house or whatever for their old age, or just to actually profit off other people. Um, like you're talking about the central bank rules, ruling out private investors. What's so bad about that? I think people privately investing or speculating on a place to live is horrible, actually. And I believe it's led to loads of the problems that we have. I don't think there's anything good about it at all. Um, I think it, I don't see why anyone could argue there's something good about people getting into property as an investment. Um, just lastly, then on the taxation issue, because you're, you're asking for a raft of tax breaks for landlords in order to keep them from exiting this totally unprofitable sector. 
Um, now, you've said that the costs have increased by 24%. Could you give us a breakdown of that? Because how could your costs have increased by 24%, apart from the property tax, which everyone has to pay, whether you own one house or ten? What are those other costs that have increased your cost by a quarter? Um, the capital allowance scheme that you want reintroduced, despite the hard left, um, as you say in your, your presentation, in survey after survey of property-related tax breaks, both Britain and Ireland have shown that they primarily benefit very high earners, very wealthy people, and are used to reduce their tax liability. And that is the only effect of them. And um, there was an Indicom survey in 2006 which found that here. So, um, yeah, I just think we, we need to hear you answering those because every day we switch on the radio and we hear that these things must be done. And with regard to the bed sits, which the chair asked about as well, that came up this morning in relation to threshold. They didn't see, I'm sure the figures show that there isn't less private rented property. There's actually more than there ever was before. And in this session, I'll take Deputy O'Dowd as well, please. I apologise for being late. I want to assure my colleague that I am not, I never have been, a uh, landlord. And indeed, uh, no, no, no member of my family has been. I wasn't the Communist Party either. You didn't have or to assure us about it. I've never been a fan of landlords, I have to be honest, and they've never been a fan of me because I stand up for people, I suppose, who are at the, the tough end of life, people who are in conflict in terms of people who have no money, who have no jobs, and I find it very difficult to live. And my concern has been increasingly, uh, for the record, I'm 42 years of public life, um, and I've been, uh, for that length of time, I've been dealing with tenants. Um, and. Only recently, I'd say in the last 12 months, there's a very significant increase in tenants to come to my office who have been told that their landlord is selling the property and they have to leave. Now, that's, that to me is unusual because it was, it was a pattern which was never there before. And there are people in that context who are in extremist and very difficult uh, family situations. They're literally on the street. I have, I've had people sleeping in cars. I've had people who are, you know, literally sleeping at night uh, on, on the side, just in, in a warm or a, a relatively well protected from the weather place. And my issue is this, that, um, and I know and accept and acknowledge I'm dealing with a very small number of landlords, and the vast majority of landlords are decent and they're not of that calibre. But uh, the, the, the reality is that would you agree that if the law were changed, uh, that you could give, if you were in a tenancy agreement with, 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 with a tenant, and I say it's two year tenancy or whatever it is, that whether you sell the house or not, that that should be a sacrosanct for the period of the tenancy. In other words, that that, that even if you sell the house, that part of that sale would be the tenancy would continue. And that would at least give continuity to a family. I have this tenancy, I have it for two years, I know I will have it for two years. I must pay my rent and must conform to all the regulations. Wouldn't that make sense to both the landlord and the tenant? And I think that's where that's where the problem is at the moment. It's the people who have no who can't afford obviously to rent anywhere else. They have very little money. They have very little uh, you know they have very little to go for them other than their sheer humanity. And what I think is wrong, what I think is really wrong, is as we said already all repeat about children children on their beds this day in, in, in hotels and hostels inappropriately accommodated, uh, possibly in danger, because who's going to protect them? And this is an appropriate place for them to be. And that's a matter for Tuesday. I think they'd want to get the finger out on that one. But wh what I'm saying is really is, would you agree that that's the way forward? That you give, if you have the tenancy secure, and if the tenant is paying, even if you have to sell the property, that the tenancy continues. The second question is, I think, an appropriate one, is that um, for many, many years, town centres were populated over the shop and over the whatever it is. Uh, and all that accommodation is gone now. It's gone for a number of different reasons. You walk to any town centre, there's nobody there at night. Whereas years ago, they were populated by families, by, you know, by living, living cities, living town centres. Now, the government are proposing to, to, to advance a new scheme to populate those areas again. And I think, I know if you've got your thinking cap on on this one, that if you could 
provided you meet the fire regulations and all the other building regulations and as much as you can, but given the age of some of the properties, we should be able to come up with a scheme, would you agree, where it would encourage you as a landlord to develop those properties, even provided that the development is within the actual physical shape of the building. In other words, you're not dividing up an existing room, but the, that's the size the rooms are because we're built in 1860 or whatever. You know, that it would accommodate maybe single, uh, single people uh, childless couples or whatever, there's a huge plus, you know, if, you, if it was to your advantage to do that, that you would get tenants in there, it would be an advantage from the state that people would have houses and I'd like your view on that. And, and the last point is, um, the last point is, I still get people telling me that the landlord won't accept the HAP. The house is for sale, it's on daft.ie or whatever it is, but they won't accept HAP. Right, now, uh, to me it seems that if we could offer a, 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 a tax incentive to, to the landlord, that if you take the HAP, uh, that, and if you give a, a tenancy of X amount of years, you know, that there would be a tax incentive for you to do that. In other words, you want the HAP because you know, you know that you're going to be paid, you know going to, it's to your advantage to develop that property and to maintain it. And it's an advantage to the tenant because they have security and a decent place to live in. And what's your view on that? Thank you, Deputy. Mr. Farkland, do you want to address those number of issues first and then have another I series of questions? I think my colleague may, may take some time and take some of those questions there too. Okay, yeah. Um, <coughs> so um, perhaps I'll start with Bernard Durkin's uh, questions um, uh, first. There's quite, a, there's quite an amount there, so it's, uh, it's difficult to, to, to keep, up, keep up track. <laughs> um, I suppose the vacant properties issue, it's very difficult to pinpoint what exactly is driving, is driving that. Um, but it, it certainly is... Um, a function of the sales that are, that are taking place, whether they are consensual or enforced. There is a mass exit of people leaving the sector, despite what Deputy Coppinger says. There is a mass exit of people leaving the sector. I accept that, tenancy, so, uh, that are tenancies that have been registered are increasing, but the Residential Tenancies Board's numbers show that there is a reduction in the number of landlords, and there is a 25% reduction in the number of landlords since the recession began. The important feature there is, are they going out of the system Permanently, or are they just going underground? Permanently, and indeed, independent research by Sherry Fitzgerald will show that for every 50 properties out of 100 that are sold, these are. That's just. They will show that for every three properties that are investment properties or buy to let properties that are sold, only one re enters the system. So you can see that with the amount of buy to let sales that are taking place at present, there is a decrease in the housing stock available for buy to let. And that, I'm, I'm sorry if it's, if it's not an easy message to take, but that is what is driving the rental increases. It is a decrease in stock. It's a decrease in stock where people want to live. People generally want to live, in the vast majority of cases, close to amenities and in city centre locations. And unfortunately, at the moment, because we've had a, a, a dearth of building since 2000, and I would suggest six, seven, as opposed to eight, as, as many commentators say, we now have a situation where we have very little in terms of supply. Um, I'm veering off tangent a little bit, but I might just, on the basis that it hits some deputy coppagers uh, points uh, at, at the same time, capital allowance schemes, I would absolutely disagree, and I, I, I really, I would absolutely disagree that they have not been a success. If you look in Dublin city centre alone, with the amount of people that are currently being accommodated in section 23 properties that are now out of the tax net, where the allowances are gone and finished, if you look at Cork Street, look at the Quays, uh, Dublin 1, Gardner Street, there are hundreds of upon thousands of apartments there that are housing people and we're very glad to have that stock at the moment and if that stock wasn't there we'd be in a position whereby there'd be a lot more people homeless because those are properties in the main are affordable properties. They're not the properties that have been acquired by, loan, by uh, the REITs. They're not the properties that are commanding 15, 1,700, 2,000 euro a month in rent. They're affordable properties. And I absolutely reject the suggestion that uh, capital allowances in areas of high demand, I'm not suggesting that capital allowances in Carrick and Shannon and in places where there isn't a demand are, are inappropriate. Of course they are inappropriate, but in circumstances where you have a demand for housing, I absolutely feel that the allowances schemes, uh, such as even as Deputy O'Dowd has mentioned, the living over the shop scheme, which was a very useful scheme, is now discontinued. They all have a role to play in the housing crisis because some, at the moment we do not have private investors uh, investing in property. That is borne out by the figures where three to one are leaving and only one is coming back in. 
What, we need where are to the numbers going up then, Chair? The number of tenancies yeah. being registered going up. I can't, I can't comment on that other than, other than to say that the, the residential tenancies boards themselves have noticed that compliance is increasing. So that is going to result in an increase in, in the number of tenancies. There are also large blocks of apartments, as you well know, that have been acquired by REITs that are now becoming let over the last six months. They're now hitting the market. They were previously half finished or in a state of hold until they were sold. They now have been sold, and I would suspect that number is in the thousands when you take account of the large portfolios that have been, have been sold. Nope. That's my point. Yes, You're but, saying it's gone but down. I suppose, I suppose you have to, it's not, it's not a one size fits all. You have to look at what are the profile of properties coming to the market. Those blocks are in the main high end apartments that are coming to the market. They are not directed at the people that are looking at affordable accommodation. Just for the point of clarity, because I just want, for the committee's point of view, are you saying quite clearly the number of individual tenancies are going up, but the number of landlords is coming down. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to what Deputy Coppinger has said in terms of number of, she, she's saying that the number of landlords has increased. What I'm saying is the number residential... Of private rented accommodation has increased. Well, units. You're talking about units. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. 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 Okay. The number of landlords, residential tenancies board figures show that the number of landlords has decreased from about 210, 212,000 down to about 170,000 over a period of four years. That's fact. That's based on their own information. That... If we look at the total rental, rental stock in the country, it's about 365,000 units. The vast majority of those, over 95% of those units, are provided by landlords with one or less properties. Okay, so these are, the, the, the market is a very fragmented market. I don't believe it's possible for one, for one solution whereby the, the state uh, pr provide uh, the solution to housing all of those people. That's just not practically or financially feasible. I don't believe that the institutional players have the appetite or the capability or the wherewithal to, to house, uh, to, to, provide a, to provide a solution because they are interested in concentrated blocks where capital appreciation is the primary objective and once market values are covered, they will exit. So you, the, the market, whether it's, I know it's not popular and it's not in, in certain quarters politically acceptable, the market will fall back to relying on the private sector to house people and at the moment, I'm sorry, it's just not fe financially feasible to invest in property. You have a situation where, by when you take account of capital repayments and borrowings, a position whereby all your interest is not deductible against rent. You have local property tax, which is a direct expense of doing business, which is not tax deductible. You have increased regulation. You've got PRTB. You've got all of the issues that go with what is meant to be a passive investment. It's far from passive. It's, actually, it's a very hands-on business. And there is nothing appealing in terms of either return or effort that is going to encourage the private sector in its current sector, in its current state. Incentivisation needs to be brought in, and I know that's not something that is, is, is uh, easy, to, easy to hear for, for, for certain people, but unless you have incentivisation, you are not going to have private investment because at the moment, with the way the market is, and this is in spite of, rent, of current rents, and we've worked figures here which are based on fact, they're properly costed by tax accountants, it is not a profitable venture to buy property at the moment at current prices and current rents when you take into account the legislative and tax positions. So, unfortunately, incentivisation is required in whatever form. Uh, we're suggesting that measures such as Deputy O'Dowd's in terms of living over the shop relief, um, urban or capital allowance schemes directed at areas of high demand, so not areas where the, where the demand doesn't exist, but in areas of provincial town centres, city centres, they are required, they're needed urgently. They have, I don't believe they have been a huge cost to the exchequer in the past because in many cases the, the, the purchaser paid for their allowances up front and really what the allowances were, despite a lot of the political rhetoric that has gone, gone on heretofore, the allowances allowed landlords to smooth their tax bill, not avoid tax, smooth it because they paid up front. The property prices were inflated by the value of those allowances at the outset, so landlords essentially paid for their allowances up front. And unfortunately, we have had a situation whereby there's been a huge amount of government intervention in the market which has undermined confidence. You have, we had lots of members and we were, we were front and centre on a, on, a, on a challenge on the Section 23 uh, abolition uh, back in 2011. But unfortunately, intervention and measures like that by government whereby you have investors that, that, that assume significant debt obligations over a period of 20 years, they pay up front for their allowances and they're told or threatened that those allowances will be removed in one fell swoop in circumstances where they have the debt underpinning those allowances and have paid for the allowance up front, measures like that significantly erode confidence. And what we're hearing back from our members is that that confidence, uh, our lack of confidence, is a significant inhibitor to investment and will continue to be 
measures around rent controls. I mean, there is a lot of talk about rent controls, but one has to remember in looking at rent increases, rents halved in Dublin City Centre from 2007 to 2014. They halved. So when you see figures, rents have increased by 50%, they've increased 50% from 50%. So they're still not back at where they were at the peak. But surely the rents in 2000, up to 2007 were based on a property bubble which was vastly inflated and, and where incomes were it had, to, had to follow in order to stay with the property market. That's one part of it. I'd, I'd like a response to that as well. Because if, we, if we're harking back to what happened during the peak time of the boom and hoping we're going to go back there again, well then we're going to go down the same way we went down the first time and that's a fact. Can I... Can, 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 can I just very we, briefly because we, that didn't come up. A reply that hasn't come up is is the, the the rate of rent increases. The rate of rent increases, and for instance, do you discriminate? Do your members discriminate between uh, uh, social welfare supported tenants and and, and other ones and the refund of deposits? Okay. Yes, I know. Yeah. Sorry, to, just just to, fin to finish on that point. Rents, and I think if you look back even to 93, 94, your rental expenses as a percentage of your income hasn't changed and you can check those figures, it has not changed. So affordability, you talk about affordability in rents, the, the, the issue with rents, it's a supply and demand issue. In no. circumstances where there was too much supply in 2007, rents halved, and that is fact. Income has come down, dramatically. I don't agree with that. Oh. Today, <laughs> I, I... Sorry. Yeah. Well, you don't no. have to agree, but look, the question was put, the committee will form its own, its own decision afterwards. But Sorry, Chair, I looked up and got clarification on this question because it's really important. There's been an increase in both tenancies and landlords, according to the RTB. I'll give you the figures because you, tr you said it wasn't an increase in landlords. Between quarter, quarter one 2015 and 16, it's increased by 16,000. The number of landlords is now at 172,000. It was 12,000 um, before that. As of this morning, the PRTB in writing have confirmed that the number of landlords registered in 2012 was 212,306. The number of landlords registered in 2015 was 170,282. That is straight from the PRTB. That's not what I see. But, but the, the high rents is bringing them back into the market, basically. Um, no, hold on for one moment. Because the committee will need clarification on this. That document you might circulate to us yeah. afterwards if yeah. it's from the PRTB and we can look at it and do that in our deliberations. Please continue. So, I accept the point about rents for everybody, providers of accommodation and people that are living in accommodation. Rents have got to be affordable. There is, there is no, there's no investment proposition in terms of getting into a market that's based on fraud. So everybody wants to see a, a situation where rents are affordable. But unfortunately, to get into the property market at the moment, you look at the prices that properties command, there has to be an element of return. If people are, are prosecuting a situation whereby people should get into a market and trade at a loss, well then we're, we're looking more charitable and uh, uh, philanthropy than actual real, the real world. The private sector will not get into, in, and it doesn't matter whether it's in Ireland or other countries, the UK, you will not have private sector investment where there is no return. And at the moment, the figures, and we, as we said, we have proven the figures, Property investment at the moment requires substantial subsidisation from people's wages if they want to invest in property. It is not a self-financing investment at the moment, and that, I'm afraid, supply is what's driving the rent increases, and until that is addressed, and it's not going to be addressed entirely by the private sector, it's, it, there is investment required by the state and the private sector. But without the private sector in, in, in providing accommodation, the rental situation will, will, or the homelessness situation and the housing shortage situation will continue because private landlords, and, and I'll come back to Deputy Coppinger, I, I, I'm not convinced and I'm not sure about what the relevance of 4% of the population being uh, landlords and 20% of the Oireachtas being landlords. I, I think that's completely an irrelevant and erroneous statistic. I think it's very relevant. No, well, I'm sorry, I don't. And I think to if you look at the decisions that were taken in the property market and the private rental market, and it was fine, it was very palatable, palatable to a lot of quarters when, it, when they happened in 2012, but when you look at some of the tax measures that were introduced, in, when landlords could least afford it, when they were the most indebted portion of the section, section of society behind developers, when you look at the tax, when you look at the tax here, sir, measures that were introduced and you look at additional charges that were introduced, everything was anti-investment, everything was anti-property. Now we're bearing the fruits of, that, of those decisions and we have a housing shortage. And 
a lot of our members will be very slow to get back in because financially it's not possible to get back in on a number of fronts. Tax, access to finance continues to be a problem. Significant deposits are needed in terms of funding buy to let property and as I said it's not it's not self financing. So I mean they're they're among the issues that, that need to be addressed and I would say tax code in particular needs to be addressed as a matter of urgency. And this is not something that we just prepared for today. We have met the Department of Finance on a number of occasions and have laboured the issue around uh, the tax code and treatment of private investors relative to our peers in the commercial sector where 100% of rent is deductible in the commercial sector. So if we rent a shop, we get 100% deductibility. You rent a, a, a residential property, you get 75% deductibility. It does result at the moment in a situation where you could have tax on a loss as a, as a landlord and that's, I think that's just unprecedented. Thank you. Um, I have a number of other uh, colleagues. Uh, Deputy O'Brien. Thanks Chair and apologies, um, I have to go to the Chamber at 10 past just for questioning the, the Minister for Housing so uh, excuse me for that. Uh, just a couple of comments and then two specific questions. First of all I live in the private rental sector uh, and that's where I want to live and I have a very good landlord so just to say that uh, and I also believe that uh, a stable housing system needs a good size, well-regulated private rental market. So I'm neither against landlords nor against the private rental market, so long as it's done in the right way. Um, and my concern, I suppose, is, is that we don't have either of those things. We don't have a stable and, in my view, properly regulated uh, private rental market, uh, notwithstanding some of your own criticisms of the regulations in place. This, the specific purpose of this committee isn't to look at the overall long-term reform of the private rental sector. That's something that I think most of us agree we need to do and we will return to it. It's specifically to look at interventions that we feel the government needs to make now uh, uh, in terms of trying to tackle the sharpest end of the housing crisis. So my two questions are in that context. The first is this, and, and you said yourself, uh, the vast majority of landlords are single property or two property landlords or what we call accidental or part-time landlords. One of the difficulties with that is, even with the best will in the world, because they see it as a passive investment, they don't have the time or the wherewithal uh, to invest in, in running the business as a business, uh, like an active investment. And therefore, even good landlords often don't know the law, don't know the changes in the law, don't understand how they, those things operate, and that has an impact on the nature of the private rental market. The biggest problem is it means they're risk averse and they think very much in short term uh, uh, calculations. So my first question is, do you think it's possible, given the fact that we know that having such a large number of single property landlords makes them risk averse, do you think we can have a stable private rental sector in the short to medium term with so many accidental landlords or do we not need as a longer term objective to start, and I've chosen my words carefully, but disincentivizing those types of investors from being in that market because they're in the wrong place. They should be elsewhere. And if you do, do you have ideas or proposals around how that could be achieved in a way that's least disruptive to the people who live in that sector? That's the first one. The second one is on rent certainty, and I, I use this word certainly, not rent control. See, I have a strong view that rent certainty in the long run is good for both the landlord and tenant because it creates stability in the market and therefore you don't have the dramatic crashes in rental income when things go bad and you don't have the dramatic spirals in rent. And your own organisation and other landlords representative organisations in this state are, are steadfast against it. And I'm just wondering because in, our, in the context of our current deliberations, rent certainty would be a huge benefit in terms of uh, stopping that section of people who are at risk of homeless today because of spiralling rents, many of whom are actually working and not in receipt of state support from, from becoming homeless. Are you open to a conversation with government about uh, uh, rent certainty in exchange for a sensible reform of the tax treatment of landlords. And when I say reform, I don't mean tax breaks. I mean starting to treat landlords as professional businesses and taxing uh, landlords in the same way as we tax other professional businesses. Because I just think if you continue to set your face against any kind of rent certainty, you're not going to get uh, an open conversation for many of us on the other side of what your demands are. Whereas if you at least indicated a willingness to contemplate rent certainty, there's a conversation to be had there which could be very, very good for tenants because it could find a way of controlling rents in a manageable form in line with inflation, at the same time as helping professionalise your own sector, which I think even you would accept is something that is needed and would be beneficial for landlord and tenant. I'll take the remaining uh, questions. Uh, Deputy Butler. 
Um, thanks, Cahir. Look, um, I would like to thank you for coming in and for your submission. Um, as Deputy, o as Deputy O'Brien has stated. Um, we're here now with the past four or five weeks, and we, we have been tasked with trying to come up with some solutions to the to the crisis that is housing and homelessness. And we have to, you know, we have to quite question every single grouping that comes in here and see because we have to make recommendations to the Dáil by the 17th of June. And you know, I was travelling up here this morning and I was listening to reports on housing the whole way up, and like we really are at crisis mode. Um, you're saying that you, right, you were established in '93 to represent property owners in the private rental sector and obviously you know um, landlords have to make a profit because they're not going to be in the business otherwise like that, that that's what drives their economy but there is a perception out there and actually I think it's a reality not a perception that landlords don't want HAP now, while I, why, I, why I'm going back to HAP again is because it has come up at an awful lot of these um, sessions. HAP comes up constantly. And what we're hearing, and I, I only heard, heard it myself again yesterday in my own clinic, that, you know, people... The, the supply, as we all know, of local authority housing is, is practically non-existent at the moment. It has slowed down to a snail's pace. And the only hope that people have is to get um, private rented accommodation. Now, for an awful lot of these um, tenants, they are on, on a HAP scheme because they're on a local authority waiting list. So they're on a HAP scheme. But what's happening is they're going along, to, they're, they're, going along they're viewing houses, and the minute they, they mention HAP, and I think all my colleagues will back me up on this, the minute they mention HAP, the landlord doesn't want to know. So I think that's one thing um, that needs to be addressed. And, and just in relation to, to at the start, um, HAP is paid directly to the landlord. It's the one, you know, the other allowance is working, but HAP is, is paid directly to the landlord. The other thing I'd like to ask you about is um, you made a statement there that improvements made to a property cannot be claimed as an expense unless and until the property is sold. Is that a disincentive, so, to any landlord to do up their property and to keep it at a reasonable state of repair? Because if there's no um, incentive to claim back the money, you're, you know, um, I, I don't think the incentive is there because, you know, we hear constantly about people who are living in substandard accommodation in relation to um, insulation and um, wiring, electric wiring, things like that. Um, the other question is, um, I think uh, Mr. Fawn spoke about rented accommodation, if it was unfurnished, um, the cost may be 25% less. Did I pick you up right on that? Um, that maybe maybe you might just touch on that again, because that might make a big difference to people who are trying to come up with, with, with if they could rent the house, and if the cost of renting it was 25% less, if it was unfurnished, a lot of people have their own furnishings. And just uh, the fourth point is, I welcome your fact um, in relation to the bed sits. A lot, a lot of the organisations I have spoke to feel there's definitely merit in looking at bed sits again and you know there's an awful lot of people seeking um, single single persons looking for accommodation so that's that's one point you made that I did welcome thank you very much uh, deputy Ryan uh, thanks chair in relation to the, the dozen um, recommendations basically you've put to us today in a range of areas there but particularly in the ones where you're seeking incentives for your members to kind of get into the into the area have you, have you put any numbers on this in terms of if, if these are delivered, what uh, will result? What will it deliver in terms of numbers over the next kind of year or so? Because we're looking at trying to find solutions to deal with the immediate crisis. So in a year or two years, what will it deliver? Because uh, there would be a cost to the Exchequer. Uh, and in order to kind of uh, to justify that cost, you have to see what the return would be. So, have you done any run any numbers on that? And the second question I have relates to your uh, recommendation that you should abolish the proposed deposit protection scheme. Now, I've come a lot, come across lots of kind of spurious kind of uh, indications from landlords as to why they're holding on to kind of. Um, Deposits. So I can't understand what I'm asking you to do and justify that position. Why would you want to abolish a system that would be, f be fair to both sides in terms of deposit retention? Deputy Wallace. Uh, thanks for your love. Um, well, first of all, I'm sorry I'm late as well, and uh, I, you may have uh, addressed some of the points I'm raising, I don't know. Um, but the uh, I don't know if you expressed opposition to the idea that uh, apartments should be sold with tenants in place like you would have in most of Europe. 
if things were different than the way they are now, if, for example, uh, if it was actually difficult to rent a residential unit in Ireland at the moment, if you were a landlord and you were trying to let the place, or, or if you were buying a property from a landlord, it would be a benefit to have a tenant in place. I mean, you probably don't need me to tell you that if you were selling a commercial unit in Ireland today, it's worth more if there's a tenant in place than if it's empty. empty an empty unit uh, is problematic. A occupied unit with uh, a regular a tenant paying his way uh, is a bonus and it adds value uh, to the sale. Um, and the, the, um, the other thing I was, um, as uh, obviously uh, I was a landlord, right, and uh, I, I let a lot of properties. And uh, I can tell you that uh, I can remember when I was getting crazy money to rent properties. I remember when I was getting terrible money to rent properties. And now they're back up to crazy money again. Uh, if I was back in the game of being a landlord, I would rather much, I would much rather consistency. And I would much rather regulation. And uh, this thing of up and down and uh, boom and bust is actually not good for business. And nobody benefits from it. And listen, I mean, I, I'm listening to you uh, um, highlighting some of the challenges of being a landlord today. And listen, and come here, I, I understand uh, where, where some of your points are coming from. But we do have a dysfunctional market in Ireland. And it needn't be that way. And if we, do you not think that if, if we regulate it and change it in such a way where uh, there is uh, rent certainty for the tenant. That also, would you not think that that brings some certainty to the landlord as well? You're, you're telling us that life isn't good for the landlord. Well, life ain't good for the tenant either. And I agree with you that it isn't a good place for either of them over the last, up and down over the last number of years. So, would, do you not think that we should change uh, the status quo? We should do things different? Do you not think that uh, Introducing regulation that controls rent, controls uh, that introduces rent certainty to a degree, will actually be better for your industry in the long term. Mightn't be seem so attractive in the short term, but surely uh, all business uh, investments investors are interested in in an even long term certainty. That's why people buy money in bonds that are zero percent sometimes. And uh, uh, people buy German bonds before they buy any ones. And uh, it, there's bugger all return off them, but you don't lose any money on it, right? Um, so uh, I'm asking you, uh, do you not think that uh, even for yourselves, more regulation and uh, more evenness in how the industry operates would be in the interest of landlords too? Thank you. Finally, Deputy O'Sullivan. The 170 or so thousand landlords who are registered, um, I was just wondering what percentage are members of your organisation and I suspect that there are quite a considerable number of landlords who are not registered with anybody. Um, I don't want to demonise all landlords because I know landlords have ended up with tenants from hell, but I unfortunately come across too many of the landlords who are big into their rights and not their obligations, uh, who have very substandard and inferior accommodation. And you mentioned the North Circular Road, which I know very, very well. And the two issues, one, you're mentioning the vacant sites, and some of them have been left vacant or vacant uh, properties for a very long time. And there is a call that there would be a tax after a certain stage on those when they have been left idle. And we could, I could replicate that in so many other communities in the, in the Dublin Central constituency I represent. But the other aspect to the North Circular Road is the appalling standard of rented accommodation along that street. And it has really ruined what is a beautiful, um, should be a beautiful street like Griffith Avenue or somewhere else. But Private rented has really made it very, very difficult for the, the residents, the communities in that area. And you just have to look at them. And practically, a, a place is every second one is rented. And you just know from the look of it that it is rented. So there's that aspect of it as well. So that leads me to um, the, the need for a code of conduct or protocols for landlords um, that they do, as well as the rights, that there, there are obligations. Um, and the other one, I mean, we've talked about rent increases, but... 
just this morning one, and I don't know how anybody can stand over this, for one room in Dublin Central, um, the rent went for one man from 480 euro to 860. And I don't know how any landlord could stand over that increase, exact same accommodation, regardless of what the market is. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes. Just before you reply, just to summarise, a number of deputies uh, spoke. Uh, your presentation talked about tax exemption for long-term lettings, and a number of deputies looked at uh, that issue in particular around rent regulation, rent certainty, and also the other side, that if you have a long-term letting, one of the problems that we're all finding is that when a property goes in the market, it's sold vacant, whereas if it's a commercial property, it tends to be sold with a sitting tenant. Um, so your views on that, that if there was a long term, be it a five or a ten year or whatever that period is, uh, tenancy, that if the property were to be sold, that it's sold with the tenancy to continue to its natural duration. Uh, it's causing huge problems selling those properties on the market because people in, invariably, the properties have been sold vacant. Um, so uh, that's a, a summary of some of those issues. So Mr. Lawler. Yeah, I might just address that question that you've raised in regard to long-term lettings, because we, have an organ as an organisation, have made presentations to government before or to ministers before around providing a tax incentive. And I know tax incentive is a dirty word for some, but in order for people to change their habits, we do have to encourage and incentivise them to do so. Within that context, uh, in terms of reviews of the agricultural sector, the Department of Finance introduced a tax relief on the long-term leasing of land. And the purpose of that was because farmers who were letting land were invariably doing it on a one-year lease for fear that giving a lease in, in any longer than that would give the tenant some rights. So on a general basis and on a casual basis, and if you go to length and breadth of Ireland, landlords will let or farmers will let their land on a one-year lease. So in order to overcome that, the Department of Finance introduced a tax incentive to provide tax relief on rental income where a lease of land is entered into for a period of in excess of five years. So as part of our submissions previously, we would have argued that a similar incentive should be brought in as regards residential property to encourage landlords to enter into long-term leases to give tenants the security of the tenure that they would require. And I think that fits in with an awful lot of the points that have been raised both by Deputy O'Brien and Deputy Wallace and some of the deputies today around even if it was that a long-term lease was in place, the disposal of the property would be subject to that lease, one would imagine, on the basis that it covered off over a period and also in, in, in terms of uh, giving the security of tenure that, that a tenant requires and to avoid uh, peaks and troughs and how their, resident, their tenancy was being managed, it would help a lot. Another thing, just on some of the other points that have been made, there, there tends to be a feeling, whether it's right or wrong, that to invest in property is a very bad thing to do. And that might be right. And fundamentally, it might be right. I don't agree with it, but I can see how somebody might have that view. But what has happened here is as the state has, has invited in the private rental sector, to provide rental accommodation. And that has happened. That's just the way it is. So we have to deal with the reality of the situation we're in. There's no point in beating, inviting people in to invite property and then beating them up when they're in there. That's not going to achieve the end game. And from our point of view as landlords, we do feel that the taxation treatment that has been applied since 2009 in particular, and this answers your question, Deputy Coppinger, around how is it that costs have increased, that comes from DKM consultants who are independent of us that cost figure of increasing by 24%. But one of the reasons is that we are not entitled to claim a tax expense in respect of 25% of the interest that we incur. And in some circumstances, that can result in landlords getting taxed on losses. And when you have a situation where anybody's getting taxed on losses, they're clearly not going to invest. So arguments around whether or not there's more landlords or less landlords or more units or less units, fundamentally, there are less landlords going to invest in a sector where they're disincentivised from investing. It would be preferable for a landlord to invest in a commercial property where they're not disincentivised from investing. So from our point of view, we would argue in the first instance that we have to, first of all, stop disincentivising them to invest, and in the second instance, look at ways of incentivising them to invest. Now, that might be to incentivise them to invest and to provide properties that would be suitable to solving the homeless crisis that we have presently. And if that was done in the context of long-term leasing, it mightn't be a bad way for the committee to start thinking. 
Mr. Farpman to conclude, or Mr. O'Brien or Ms. McCall? Not completely answered there. It's, it's the question of. Um, yeah, no, yeah, yes, yeah, the incentive to have, which I don't think you'll disagree with. But just to go back to uh, the question again about landlords, uh, that, that if a property is sold, there's no problem with selling a property, but that it should be legally the tenancy continues until it ends, at least. That's the key point. Would yes. you agree with that? I think that's a critical point. Um, intervene on that. I, I myself, uh, similar to Deputy Wallace, I've been renting property since the early 90s, so I've seen two or three cycles as well. And I would have to say, up until two years ago, the issue of, of tenure wasn't an issue. Tenants, even when you wanted them to stay, would move on after 18 to 24 months. Long-term letting was not something that prevailed in the market. This issue about tenure has really only became pre prevalent in the last 18 months. And the issue of rents as well. Rents were always pretty steady throughout the 90s. Until the late 90s, there was a, absolutely a jump. But they steadied out again until 2004, where they jumped at that point in time. But to think the undermining symptom here is supply. Or, that is the root cause of the problem. There has to be more supply. The state, financially, practically speaking, time-wise, cannot solve this by themselves, and nor can the institutional players. The institutional players are not interested in the end of the market that are most affected by the homelessness uh, crisis. And indeed, the homelessness crisis has probably came about by private tenants squeezing the lower income tenants out of the market because they can afford the higher, rent, higher rents and they are now renting units that previously were inhabited by people now that are having difficulties. So I think the supply issue absolutely is, is key. It's going to take time to resolve but you have got to create the climate and the environment that facilitates bringing more supply on. And if I, I might just address one of the issues that Deputy Ryan raised in relation to deposit protection. I appreciate you might, you might come across cases uh, uh, where there is issues with deposit, uh, deposits and refunds, etc. Our membership, I would have to say, we don't see that issue because our members, as a, by and large, are, are absolutely compliant. They're educated members. They're okay with the, with the laws and regulations. But you have to bear in mind the level and incidence of the d deposit disputes. 800 disputes arose last year in the context of over 100,000 tenancies. The UK have a deposit protection scheme in place, and it is a huge burden to the Exchequer. So given that the finances are limited to everybody, this side of the desk and that side of the desk in terms of the state, introducing a regime and a structure for, the, for processing deposits that is going to be hugely onerous on the Exchequer in circumstances where it's, it's less than 1% of all tenancies. If, to use the PRTB's figures themselves, twice the number of disputes that are before them at the moment are in relation to rent arrears. Twice, almost three times, are rent arrears relative to disputes. That's a fact that I know people don't want to hear, but if we were to get into what's consuming the PRTB's time, they're the figures, they're the issues. So I would absolutely caution against deposit protection, or deposit protection on the basis, as Stephen has already outlined, when a tenant leaves on a Friday, they want their deposit back because they're moving into somewhere else on a Saturday. They have their deposit in their hand when they go on to their next property. If you introduce a deposit protection scheme, and I'm familiar with how it works in the UK, it is 28 days, and the level of landlord claim against the deposit in that system is much higher than here because where it's going into an administrative body that is independent of the tenant and the landlord, it is much easier for the landlord to say, this is wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, and make a claim. It goes into an independent body and they make a call on it. You are inviting more problems on, dispute, on, on, on deposit disputes by introducing that framework. And it, it's not an issue for our, our members on the basis that they're compliant. Um, but if I was objectively looking at it, I really think you're, 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 and in fact, the government appointed body who, who commissioned the investigation into deposits and the relevance of having a deposit uh, protection infrastructure warned against it and recommended against it. So your opposition on the basis of the burden on the state, not, uh, it's more, it's more not to your own fact members? That you're, you're mean, there's an easier way to solve the problem. We would have suggested that the PRTB charge be increased by five euro to cover off a fund, to cover off deposits that are erroneously kept by landlords. It makes a simpler solution to the problem than perhaps creating a new agency which will bring a body of work with it. There's a lot of questions not actually answered, Chair. I don't want to... There's a lot of questions not answered. For example, could they send us the information if there isn't time? In relation 
the increased costs, that hasn't been answered. And also, how many properties will be released, and are, I assume they're being held, if you get this tax break? You know, you're arguing Just for tax answer, break. How many properties one. would that the, be released the, into the public? The, the DKM report was a government uh, commissioned report, and we could make that report available. Um, and the analysis that you're looking for is within that. Um, in relation, to, I, I, you might just repeat the second question in terms of the number. Of you're problems. asking for a tax break to be reintroduced, yeah. right? How many properties would that reintroduce? Additional properties for rent. Uh, we need to work that out because we have to work out would it not be better to invest such a tax off, break, sorry, in social housing yeah. instead, for example. All, all we can work off on that is prior experience and. I'm, I'm at odds to, uh, to yourself in relation to the effectiveness of those schemes, but they were hugely successful in terms of inner city. Inner city, the tenants that are now living in those those properties now, they house thousands of people along the, along the quays and in inner inner city in quality apartments. Some of them, the earlier schemes I accept, were smaller apartments, but if you look at the later schemes in Cork Street, 1,000 square foot, two beds, they're quality accommodation and they're at a level that is affordable yeah. uh, uh, to No, you, you said this earlier. I'm talking about additional properties that are being held back right now but would be released by your members and others. Schemes, our if, schemes will if we not gave assist. Tax our break. schemes will not uh, tax. The, the additional information I'll get by means of correspondence because I'm conscious we have other witnesses. Very briefly, the issue that was raised by Deputy Butler in relation to the HAP, if anybody would like to refer to that, and then we'll conclude this section. Take that. Yeah, HAP and rent supplement. Um, we know that a third of all tenancies are covered under the HAP and, and rent supplement as we stand now. So we know that an awful lot of people are in receipt of it. Um, there's big issues around the HAP system itself and rent supplement. Um, one of them would be that the HAP is paid, first of all, it's not market rent. The HAP is paid in arrears not in advance, and that can cause huge difficulties because the market takes the rent in advance. There's no communication between um, the people administering the HAP and a landlord, so if the payments stop, um, a landlord gets no details at all, so it's a communication issue there. There's no a person in receipt of HAP doesn't come to a landlord with confirmation that they can get uh, they are in receipt of HAP. So they come and say that they can apply, they have to apply for HAP. So the, the situation around that is, is much more difficult and much more fraught. The system itself is not fit for purpose. Uh, rent supplement is paid directly to the tenant, um, uh, unless the tenant gives consent for it to be paid to a landlord. And if it's not paid, uh, if it's not paid on, then again there's difficulties, uh, and the difficulties obviously affect the person who's living in the accommodation if they're not paying it on, because they, they go into arrears um, and the money is used for different um, different things in that situation. So really, the situation around the government subsidies are they're not fit for purpose. Can, can we just before as we conclude on this point? I, no, I just want to make, I'll, I'll let you in, but I want to make a specific. We had the Department of Social Protection in this morning, we've had Threshold and we've discussed this issue around the, the state payments for whether it's uh, RAS or HAP or whatever. Uh, and we've asked the Department of Social Protection from their point of view to come back to us in writing with um, recommendations that they feel would be an improvement to give people who are dependent on those supports an equal opportunity. I would ask you to do likewise. Those issues that you have said, what we're trying to do is that people who are dependent on state supports, whether they're in the RAS scheme, rent supplement or the HAP scheme, that, that when they present they have an equal opportunity and you've given all the reasons or you've given a number of reasons why they don't have an equal opportunity and if you could put those in writing because we will we will, we want to uh, put that together with the recommendations that will come from social protection to make something meaningful happen absolutely it is the system that's at fault here not the individual um, and obviously market rent is key to something like this and if, if somebody is not able to pay market rent then it's very difficult for them to source accommodation on the open market do you, that, sorry, do you accept though, that landlords don't want to um, communicate with the tenant in relation to in relation to HAP? They just they just seem to walk away from it. They're they're not even trying. That's that's the perception that we're getting the whole time. That the landlords just do not want to engage with somebody if they're um, receiving a HAP supplement. Uh, no, um, that's not, a, a, and our members would be aware on, under the equal status legislation that they have to um, treat everybody equally. 
But and we know, of course, that that nearly seventy thousand people are in receipt of, of some sort of subsidy. So we we know that they're there already. The problem now is market rent and meeting somebody um, straight off. They need to be in a position to pay market rent, and the HAP and the rent supplement doesn't pay market rent in a lot of cases, and that is a huge difficulty. And also, again, we're back to it, it's not you know there's no confirmation that they have an entitlement. Once we let somebody into a property. Um, if they don't pay any rent after that, we have to follow procedures and we can be months and months with no income and a person residing in a property. So that causes huge difficulties. So the whole system, the HAP system, the rent supplement system, it needs to, it, it needs to work with the market system that's out there. It needs to be paid in advance. It needs to be paid in full and directly to the landlord. I'm asking you to put a note in writing to that effect to the committee on, on those specific issues because it has risen this morning. Uh, we're just about to conclude. Mr Farknan, would you like to... Yes, if, you, if I could, just on a point that you raised yourselves about long-term letting and um, selling properties of vacant possession. The trend has changed very significantly in that now. The pre-63 properties are now selling with tenants in situ and that is in the last three to six months of the, uh, taken off quite, uh, quite successfully. And the long term, and the long term, as we've mentioned previously, the long term renting is a great idea, suit for us. But the costs involved that are being pushed onto the private rental sector are making it prohibitive to give long term leasing. And now we have energy conservation coming down the road, so that's going to cost an awful lot more. So if we had some sort of certainty from government that would enter into a long term arrangement, that we would have uh, control on costs. To a certain extent. Thank you very much for your, your time and thank to all the deputies for your questions. We hope we have been of help to you. And if, it's, as I said at the outset, if there are any items that you wish to have clarification on or more information or uh, any backup, we will be too pleased to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to th thank you for your attendance today. Your submission, as I said, will be on the Committee's website and also uh, the additional information which you said you'd furnish, not meaning to rush you but uh, you might furnish it to us sooner rather than later because this committee will be reporting in a, only a short number of weeks' time. We'll suspend for a couple of moments while the next witnesses come in.